I was so impatient. Like, I want to meet this soulmate. I, you know, like, I'm ready, I'm ready. The truth is I wasn't ready until I was actually ready. Welcome to the Deja Vu podcast, where we believe that living a life of magic can be the default. Join us each week as we playfully and authentically dive into the mysteries of life and explore what it truly means to be human. From spirituality, wellness, and all things to boo, we don't hold anything back. So without further ado, let's let the magic unfold. Today's episode is sponsored by Becoming with a Q. So Becoming is a space for community to come together and to realign what it truly means to be you in the full entirety of yourself before you were told who you were meant to be. This is connecting with the essence of who you've always known yourself to be, but being held in a community of individuals that are pioneers creating an ecosystem to reflect back to you all of the blind spots to create a structure that allows you to genuinely build an authentic life from the foundation up. Becoming host retreats all around the world, also an online community, trainings, and so much more. I truly believe in becoming with my whole heart and soul because I have had the blessing to be able to walk very intimately with the founders of Becoming, Benjamin and Azra, who have single-handedly changed the entire course of my life, aligning me with the prosperity that I have always known is possible, but have never been reflected it through my immediate environment until meeting them. It is truly an honor and I am so excited that the Deja Blue podcast is partnering with Becoming because it is a place that all of the information that can be absorbed from the Deja Blue podcast can actually be put into real tangible action steps and allow you to build a life from the inside out that actually resonates with your own heart frequency of truth. The next offering for Becoming is a four-week online program called Becoming Prosperous. Aligning ourselves from the inside out with a truly prosperous life and actually learning to understand what prosperity really even means. It goes so far beyond just our finances. Truly recognizing that prosperity lives within our immediate friends, how we serve our community, our service to the world, our relationship with our finances, our relationship with our body, our relationship with the earth and recognizing that how we do anything is how we do everything. And so this four week course is going to be breaking it down right to the bare basics and allowing ourselves to rebuild a life of true prosperity. So if you want more information about it, go check out the link in the show notes. And without further ado, welcome to today's episode. Hello, you beautiful bluebirds, and welcome back to another episode of the Deja Blue podcast. Mm. I'm really excited today and also a little bit nervous mm. in, in a good kind of way, in the sense that today's guest uh, is actually, this is the first time meeting her in person. <laughs> However, I have been graced with being able to place her words in my ears. And over a course of a few weeks, every single morning, she was a part of my morning practice and I got to download into my consciousness her book, Fuck like a goddess, which of course you can imagine, um, the title captured my attention ASAP. I was like, uh, I didn't walk, I ran to download that book. Um, and I can tell you that it definitely didn't disappoint. So I got to understand the weavings and the workings of this woman through her words and her life lessons and her vulnerable transparency around sharing some of the deepest wounds and the places that she extracted gold to be able to share wisdom with the world. And so it has directly impacted my, my life and given me a breath of permission for the authenticity of who I truly am and I think that this is the greatest gems in life is when we come across people that allow us to be more of ourselves that is the greatest gift we can ever give ourselves and it's also simultaneously going to be the gift that we give others and so it is truly an honor to be sitting here not only with an author and a guide mentor life coach motivational speaker everything in between um, and woman of the healing arts and the deeper mysteries of what it truly means to be human to the fullest capacity we have have Alexandra Roxo with us on Deja mm. Blue podcast. Hello, darling. Well, that really touched my heart. Like, it started tearing up a little bit. It's mm. really, uh, it's everything that a creator, artist, writer mm. wants is to hear that someone interacted with your work and took it in and felt it and that it impacted them, mm-hmm. you know, impacted them. Mm. Uh, it, it, it's the... The vulnerability that I crave for 
Mm. And I think in a world of filters and in a world of being a version of ourselves that we think will be accepted, or if we're a little bit too loud, or if we're a little bit too out there, or if we talk about sacred sexuality, or if we really go into the taboo with plant medicines or working with indigenous cultures, then we're going to be outcasted. And mm. also at the same time, it's that space that I feel like I can actually drink the purity of the water of what is actually being shared. And so I just want to acknowledge, I mean, it's such an honor to be able to actually sit with you in person and directly acknowledge this for you, but mm. um the courage that it takes not only to go to those places but then to write a body of work mm -hmm. so vulnerably mm -hmm. and then to put it out there for the world to judge it yeah know? it's literally like yeah I can <laughs> leave it but this is my heart and it's yeah. like pumping and there's blood splitting out and you're like oh, yeah here we are. <laughs> that kind of turns me on you know I love that kind of level of risk it feels like a spiritual risk it feels like I'm like if I was holding on to my vulnerability, to my own epic failures and moments of, you know, meeting my wounding or um, putting my foot in my mouth or getting heartbroken, if I was holding on to those things, like for me, I wouldn't be being true to me. And what, what like, why? Why hold on to them out of fear? So there's like, there's like this, you know, juicy self-sacrificing. I'm like, just take it. See me <laughs> in my mess. See me as a human on a journey, but also like ugh, having endured deep pain because we all have. I'm not special. My story is not special. It's a story of many women. The ideas that are in my book are not, you know, they're, they're universal, mm -hmm. but it's the courage to actually say like, oh, I'm going to get really real about this. And that's just been so important to me on my journey, mm -hmm. especially as as a woman and not holding back. I mean, I come from uh, the South. I grew up in Georgia. And I mean, you don't talk about certain things, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm curious about that because <laughs> from the, un even just the title of your book yeah, and then the context of where you grew up and where you where you came from and where you were born where your soul chose to incarnate into there is a vast journey there between is. the publishing of the book and your birth yeah um that has <laughs> has gone and and also I, I feel like um there is a willingness like you said you know there's like there's an existential kink within the death part of like is that all you got i'm here for it you know? <laughs> and like that also creates the warp sweet quantum healing yes and the leap that happens between the birth of uh, the, the birth of you and the birth of the book so i'd yeah. love to for you to break down i hope this isn't too much of a broad brush stroke but for you to break down a part of your journey of going from mm. living in an environment that maybe not, does not um support the unfolding and the flowering yeah. of your true gifts to then being who you are today and how you show up in the world which from my perspective is unscripted raw wild pristine and also focused on what it is that you're actual you're actually here to bring to the world and i really connected with that mm, thank you so there's a lot yeah there's a lot in that question one I, i'm gonna just lay down kind of a, a thread which is from a young age, I knew that something about my life had to do with sexual healing. Now, I wouldn't say right now it's like a main focus, but this book had a, a core focus around the healing of the split between spirituality and sexuality. And so I learned at a young age that both of my parents had gone through childhood sexual abuse. And so I was grow I grew up in a field of trauma um, of two people who had unprocessed, you know, pretty... It, it, I don't, there's no hierarchy on abuse or trauma, but, you know, sexual abuse is a sticky one. It's, it's a tough one. Um, it's not, uh, like say uh, there are other areas that maybe are more palatable. Um, so growing up in a, in a household where there was addiction and mental illness from that trauma, I learned through my own seeking that like, there's going to be some healing. There's something here that I, like, there's a reason I'm here. And that didn't come from me. That came from meeting my first spiritual teacher when I was 12. So mm -hmm. part of the magic of my journey with my mother, which is very karmic, is that she was on her healing journey. And so she took me to this amazing healer, intuitive, psychic, spiritual teacher named Bobby Drennan, who was on the Rainbow Crest Farm in Tennessee. And his waiting list was like two years or something crazy. And he wasn't like, he wouldn't let himself do TV interviews. He would say no to all of those things uh, because he wanted to just keep his private kind of practice. 
when I first saw him, he said, I want to explain you something. I see, I saw a vision and it's you in this like Greek arena, this huge stage. Mm -hmm. And you're performing on this stage, but you have these like rocks that are like tied to your body. And in my vision, I kept telling you, you're going to need to take those off. And he was explaining to me karma and explaining to me like what, how my healing, you know, with a vision and a visual, the imago of that was very powerful. Like I kind of got it at a young age. I'm like, oh, okay. Like <laughs> I have some karmic baggage to deal with. <laughs> um, and he explained to me a little bit more about the laws of karma, about my aura, about my energy, about like who my soul is. And, you know, that was really powerful for me because I got to see that like my story living with my, you know, parents, their stories, that it wasn't personal. Like it was part of this soul curriculum that I was a part of. Now, it didn't mean that I could like unweave that or or make that an easy exit. Like the, the sort of the journey of that, I mean, pff, continues obviously, but there were, there were many years where I was like, oh, I'm actually unpicking a lot of this karma, a lot through ayahuasca ceremony. And, and now I'm in a phase where I feel free from that particular layer. But anyway, going back to the, the beginning of the journey. So my dad is Brazilian mm -hmm. And my mom is from Virginia. And um, so I grew up with like these two perspectives on what it means to be a woman and a spiritual woman. Like in the Protestant church and the Bible Belt, there's no there's no women figures. Like they don't exist. Um, I wasn't allowed to be like an expressed even little girl. I remember like being told, you know, masturbation is bad and like don't show this and um, – and then I would go to Brazil and my my father's family, which is interesting, is like my grandma, she initiated me into a devotional practice with Mary mm. because uh, she's Catholic. And that was the only figure of the feminine that I got to experience until I was much older. Mm. And it was so visceral and embodied because my grandmother's devotion, her name was Lourdes. Mm -hmm. She lived till she was like 95. And um, her devotion to Mary was so strong. And so I got to, to see what it was like her praying the prayer beads. Um, you know, it was just so beautiful. I would sit with her. And, and that was my only access to the goddess mm -hmm. or to the mother or to the divine feminine. And then on the sexual side of my, you know, what happened in Brazil, it was just like women were expressed and doing samba and like wearing string bikinis. And they would, my cousins would laugh at me and be like, the, the bathing suit you're wearing looks like something a nun would wear. <laughs> it's like, Jesus. <laughs> um, because they were so liberated, the little girls. Um, you know, there's there's a shadow side to that as well with like an over-sexualization, et cetera. But there was something that that I got to experience around my spirituality and my sexuality between these two cultures mm -hmm. as a kid. And then, you know, that I would say are some of the roots of my still orientation to life. It's like, where is my feminine in, in spirituality? What are the traditions that I can feel fully myself within? Mm -hmm. um, and also, how does my sexuality fit into that? At this point in my journey, it's like less of a blatant kind of a, um, investigation. When I was younger, it was really like, I'm going to try all the things and I'm going to figure it out. Now I've kind of integrated those parts in a way, so I feel more at home with both. But it was a journey from that age all the way up until, I don't know, you know, 30-ish where I was like, how do how can I be a spiritual and a sexual and a sensual woman? Mm -hmm. um, you know, because even going to like Indian stuff, I, I mean, I covered my head. I'm like, there's, there's not space for that. And that's a bigger conversation about the sort of un- bridled energy of sexuality that isn't for every place and it is very it's so potent that it's there's a reason why in tantric traditions I remember this really beautiful western tantric teacher Sally Kempton um, who wrote Awakening Shakti really really magical woman I remember her saying before you start uh, practicing tantra you need to meditate for 10 years you need to have 
such a clear mind, such a clear awareness before you start bringing in sexuality and emotions and partner work. <laughs> and as a practitioner, I really heard that. I was like, oh, interesting. Like it is, all of that is really big energy to say, call your spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been a journey for me too, like having years of finding my own pathway within spirituality that can include both. And then also trusting that there's a reason why mm -hmm. sexuality um, is treated so differently, you know, within spirituality. And, and that's a very broad, like, I mean, we're talking, I'm talking spirituality in a really broad sense, but um, yeah, I'm like, there's so many, there's so many there's other so directions. Many <laughs> that we can like, <laughs> like open up this little market here. Yeah. Well, I would be interested in, because um, this is a, a ripe topic right now around the binary experience of, of, of writing and wronging ourselves, And I talked about this in a previous podcast um, with Ebion in the sense of there is so much shame within uh, the female sexual expression. Um, and I mean, I think sexual expression just across the board uh, yeah. and also very much so in the, in the female sexual exp expression when also partnered with spirituality. Yeah. Um, and there is this kind of prison that we create for ourselves that is founded on a binary right and wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so if I express myself like this, this is acceptable. If I do like this, then this is not acceptable. And so we keep ourselves imprisoned, constantly fighting with ourselves back and forth. I would love to hear your perspective and your wisdom around as you went on this journey of going, hey, how, what does it mean to be a sexual being in this spiritual space so I can be fully liberated and also use my discerning of when it's necessary, when it's not necessary, when is it honored, when it's not honored? Like, how did you move through the shame mm. that was placed on you mm. from society at large, from mainstream media, from parents, from religion, from education, from literally from every angle? And then to get to the point where you're writing a book with the title, mm. which is is such a, I mean, personally, I think it's such an epic title because it's, it's like clickbait, you know, it's like, but I know. my God, when, it got my attention. <laughs> I wanted it to be Heal Yourself was the title and then Fuck Like a Goddess was like the subhead. And when, when my publisher was like, no, 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 we'll put that first. I was like, mm -hmm. Okay, I have two years to um, expand into that yeah. reality. <laughs> right. And I looked at it, I was like, all right, this is my, you know, this is another moment of expansion for me. This is another edge. Here I am. This is what I've asked for. Um, you know, and I I think that some of us are on the path where we're like initiates. We're, we keep being asked towards edges. We keep kind of having to like shed things in the fire, right? So I was like not really surprised where when I was like, but heal yourself is first. First, before you fuck like a goddess, you have to heal yourself, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. which that is problematic in its own way. So, you know, I think now I'm like, healing is an ongoing journey. It's not like a finite thing you need to do before you live a great life. Like we're constantly healing. But, um, but yeah, that title is one that I had to live into. Mm -hmm. And so to go, to go to your question, I just wanted to, to say that just so everyone heard that. It wasn't like my first... I'm going to do this. I was like, it was, it was in it. there, but it was like, there's some, there are some first steps, you know? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, so there's two things that came through and, and around shame and how do we discern when are these moments that we sort of dive in and express and self-liberate sexually, try to get out of the conditioning um, and when are moments that we don't perhaps, and how do we deal with the shame in general around either choice, actually? The first that I, the first thing I'm going to say is that now I have learned that if the choice that I'm making, like if it's going to close the hearts of the people around me, if it's going to hurt the people around me, I don't want to do it. When I was younger and I was in more of a maiden energy, I was like, I don't give a fuck. I'm liberating myself by doing this thing, and that's what's important, is that I self-liberate, whatever it is that I'm doing, right? Like I'm, I don't know, going, having, going, uh, I don't even want to throw some of those things <laughs> out there. <laughs> Bring it on, <laughs> I was just like, threesome, orgy dome, like, I don't know, <laughs> orgasmic meditation. So whatever, whatever it was, all the different edges that I played in along my journey, from the energy of my, past self, 
I was doing it because I wanted to self-liberate from the shame. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say, fuck you to society. Like, I can do whatever I want, and I can find the spiritual thread in it. Now, from where I'm sitting now, I have a little bit more like, well, what kind of a wake am I leaving behind me? You know, what kind of chaos is being created for my liberation? Mm -hmm. And it's tuning into the we, right, instead of just the me, and it's like, mm, actually, me doing that or me sharing that is going to hurt some of the people I love, right? It's a discernment piece, though, because that cannot be an excuse then to play small and to never expand, right? So you have to have a level of clarity and awareness. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you may trick yourself into doing nothing mm -hmm. to risking never, mm -hmm. right? Or there's the place where you just... Whew, I'm risking always. I don't care. I don't give a fuck. I'm so empowered and free. And other people's hearts are being hurt in the process. Mm -hmm. So that's a certain level of, you know, cultivation and awareness yeah. that, you know, now I, I really feel the hearts around me, the people around me. How are my actions either opening them or closing them. And that comes from some of my teachers too. We're like, well, does you walking into a room at like full power, sexy mama into a room of women, does is it opening them? If you look around and you feel the women and they're like, yes, I'm empowered by you. Or do you feel like, do you look around and see that they're actually kind of in, like scared? Somebody would say, well, that's their problem if they're scared. I don't believe that. Because I know what it's like. A woman can walk into a room with a certain level of open-heartedness and beauty and sexy and invite other women into her presence. Mm -hmm. Or she can do it in a way that says, I'm better than you, I'm higher than you, and it closes people down around her. It says, you're not invited. And so th this is something that I'm always attuning to. It's like, I when I was younger... It, it felt liberating to walk into a room and be like, I'm a badass bitch. I'm sexy. I'm hot. I can post whatever on the internet, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and maybe I wasn't thinking that like exactly, but that, there was an energetic of that, which was important to my journey. And I do not regret that at all. It was a claiming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm, to answer your question, it's like, the come from around our exploration and our self-liberation or our sexual liberation, the come from. And if it's coming from this place of like tenderness and love or excitement, but if it's coming from a wound that's like still really sticky, it gets sticky with everyone else, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, there's no, and, and here's the thing. I give everyone here full permission, go make a mess. Hurt hearts. It's okay. Like, it's okay. That's the thing too. Like if, if you're a person that say errs on the side of caution always, you probably need to like walk into a room and piss some women off and like then be like, whoa, who does she think she is? Right? So everyone's journey is so different. So different. I will say to address the shame piece. Um, mm, I think that the shame, like our culture is still living with this cloak of shame around our sexuality, whether it's, whether we're walking around like saying, hey, we're free. We're not free until everyone's free. You know, we're connected to this greater web. Just because you may be able to make love with your partner and not feel ashamed now because you've done so much healing work, you've broken free of all of these things, it's still so deeply embedded in the collective. I talk about this in my book and I, I say that one way that we know that is because we can look at all the statistics around abuse and trafficking and we know that our culture is so repressed, the shadow is so thick, which has so much shame attached to it, that there's still such deep work to be done. Mm -hmm. So it, that does start with us and it is ongoing and I think it's like, I don't have a solution for it. Mm -hmm. I do think being aware of it and us, I don't think the answer is us just being like, I'm free and I'm super empowered. It's being, it, it's being aware like, wow, this is a huge collective wound. How can I take responsibility for where it lives in me and how it lives in me? And that may change. It may go away for a few years and you're like, mm, my sexuality feels super clean and clear. 
And then you may enter another cycle. Like the healing and the awakening is like spirals, you know? Mm. I always say to people I'm working with, it's like the wound is like your relationship to it changes. It changes. But I don't think that everything just goes away. I think that it's like we're in a sacred dance with all these aspects of ourself, our sexuality being one of them. So we can feel super empowered and then we may, you know, enter a phase where it's like, ooh, another layer is coming up. I'm sure you've experienced different layers in your own journey. Um, and that's just a part of it, I think, what we're doing here. I think even in that su the sense of what you just said of saying, will it even really ever go away? I think there's a piece in that, 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 that there's a, there's a there's a piece I feel from that of saying, I think there's like some sort of belief that it's supposed to be gone by now. I know. So then there's a fight in that concept in itself, totally. as opposed to recognizing it like the ocean. And there'll be days where it, the ocean's flat and there's days where it's going to be stormy, but to recognize that the ocean is always moving. And so our relationship with the constant flux of life and also our emotional waters and who we're going to be every single day is going to constantly be in flux. But the second that we think that it's actually just meant to end entirely is could be a pocket of where the suffering even happens in itself because then it's saying, well, I'm not there yet. So then I'm unworthy. Why have I not got there yet? I should have been involved more. Why is this not, why is this continuing to present itself when actually going, you know what? Oh, shame showed up today. Yes. Hi. Exactly. And then it sort of passes through the river because you're you're just like witnessing it and it just sort of comes and goes without needing to, it to be gone or it has to, you know, have to be more yeah. evolved. Why is this showing up? And so I think that that is also the thing that I've noticed that connects all of us is, is our suffering. Yes. Like, oh it's like God. when we're in it. No one is immune. <laughs> it's like... I, when I'm living a vida loca and I'm like, hi, ah, from day three on my juice fast. And I'm like, yeah, everything's amazing. And people are like, good for you. Like, great. Like, I really can't relate with that level of energy. But, less. but when I'm like, I, I come to the Instagram and I'm like, damn, I've been in bed for three days. And I'm like having a hard time, like getting motivated to get out of bed right now. And I'm just for anybody that's suffering right now, I'm just sending you love. That is the thing that like, I know. Whoop, boom, and I was like, ah. Oh. I can feel you're human so that now when you do win, I know that it's possible for me too through yeah. your suffering, yeah. not just right to the celebration too. And I, I think that there's so much beauty laced yeah. within all aspects of the spectrum of the human experience. And you just spoke so beautifully into it. Um, yeah. I'd love to open up the conversation uh, in honoring of the chapter that you're in right now, which is... Well, first and foremost, actually, before I go into that, I just want to acknowledge that what you just shared with me really hit home in a personal way in the sense of I went through the maiden phase of, well, my truth is, this is my truth. And that those two words are actually very triggering for the people closest to me because my truth could be like being sexy and, 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 and my family watching online and being like, oh, really? Or did you have to say that? Or like, right. and so it, it actually created... Um, pain for the people that were closest to me because it was my truth and as much as that was a massive part of the claiming of a new default based off of a massive death of what I wasn't yeah now actually it's rolling into an empathy of a graciousness that is left in the wake, yeah. which is um, a discernment of when is the time exactly. and knowing that it's there and it's, 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 it's this new default. Like this, this, we got this, like we're yeah. packed. Yeah. And there's a discernment of when it is, is, is honored in space and it'll bring healing into the space and when it'll actually subtract energy from it. So yeah. um, thank you for so eloquently allowing me to receive um, some medicine from a reflection of the the journey of the, from the maiden to the mother archetype and so this yeah. kind of leads into my next question is as you as you move from the maiden into the mother archetype for just some context the maiden from my perspective is seeking external validation thinks the grass is greener on the other side super whimsical wants to try all the fruits of life no, no matter what cost <laughs> this is very exciting um the mother archetype is more grounded and rooted in herself mm. instead of thinking that the grass is greener on the other side she's nourishing the soil that she's standing mm. on Beautiful. I love doesn't that. have as much to prove still proves a little bit but doesn't have as much to prove the crow yeah. don't have anything to prove yeah, i love her, <laughs> like, I love her. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel that you are moving now as a default into the maiden archetype. And so not, not maiden. Sorry, mother. Thank you. Freudian slip. Sorry, We're just gonna no. <laughs> flip it and reverse it. 
rewind, edit. Uh, I think I did it, but like, yeah, you yeah. know, I don't know. Maybe I have another sex party. I mean, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're good. We're good. We're good. <laughs> Not maybe saying there's little, anything wrong with that, and I may come back around to it. A little garnish of the maybe. Yeah. Uh, um, so the, uh, the, the, as the default is a mother archetype. And um, I'm curious for you in this stage of your life right now around aligning yourself with a beloved that you have been calling in for so many years and what that journey really truly looks like for you to create the inner landscape that allows you to be a vibrational match to the partner that can meet you. Yeah. Oof. How much time you got? Um, <laughs> so I think I ha- like I was so impatient. Like, I want to meet this soulmate. I, you know, like, I'm ready, I'm ready. The truth is I wasn't ready until I was actually ready. Um, a lot of relationships that I had before the partnership I'm in now were big healing relationships, but there weren't core values Um that we're creating the longevity needed because I'm still in a relationship that has a lot of healing. I'm with a practice partner, a transformational partner. We're engaging in relationship as spiritual practice, relationship as transformational practice. Mm. So there are three books that I read at a young age that I was like, well, no, one of them was more recent, but that I was like, ah, this, I want that. That's what I want. Okay. I get it. And one was the Magdalene Manuscript, which I read when I was like 21. Dear sister of mine gave it to me. I just saw her the other night. And um, we've been friends for 20 years. And then the second book was Dear Lover. That was given to me when I was um, 21 by a teacher of mine who was my first teacher who taught me about lunar rituals and the goddesses. And she was my teacher when I was 20. Now I am holding her in a space. I hold sacred space for her. Um, and she's come back and hired me 20 years later, which is kind of amazing side note. Um, (laughs) but like the, the longevity, right. Of people that come into our life that are like, I have this wisdom for you and that stay in your life, like your soul family. Like there's some Mm -hmm. special key players in mine. So those two books, Magdalene Manuscript, Dear Lover, and then when I read Richard Rudd's book, um, The Venus Sequence, where I started to, to dive into that body of work, I was like, again, further confirmation, right? That there is there is a particular, not for everyone, it's not everyone's path, right? I knew from a young age, I had a yearning, I'm like, there's this sacred partnership, there's this something that I meant to do in partnership. Mm-hmm. Um, and I read these books and I was like, oh my God, I just felt it so deeply. And I read those books again and again. I've read those books so many times over the last 20 years. I had those books with me. I was living in LA and then I moved back to New York for a quick stint. I had lived in New York for a while. And I said, I'm just going to take those two books with me. Funny enough, the publisher of those two books ended up being my publisher. And when I got the email saying my my book deal, those two books were right by my computer and they had the name of the publisher, mm-hmm. which is just such a beautiful synchronicity. Okay. Um, but I just, there, there's been this yearning inside of me. However, all the relationships, which I am very lucky, I've had some beautiful, deep, deep love. All the relationships I had until this one did not hold this spiritual core value system. There were so many beautiful lessons and all of this, but we didn't have the same frame for reality in those other relationships. Like we maybe had the same frame around artistry or other things, you know, creativity, et cetera. But I was like, I'm going to meet someone. And I don't, to put this plainly, it's like, I'm going to meet someone who is a spiritual motherfucking dude (laughs) who can meet me on my path. But is it, it, it is devoted to their path in a way that feels true to me. That doesn't feel cringy to me. It doesn't feel fake to me. That doesn't feel like, oh, I'm out there being spiritual guy, you know. But that feels, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be frank with you guys. <laughs> Look, I lived in LA for six years. <laughs> but that's someone who is, who is living their practice in such a deep way and can meet me where I'm living my practice. I just knew that in my heart that it would come eventually. And it took, it felt like it took so long. And I was, all, I was like on the edge of, of the yearning, so much deep pain and the yearning for quite a few years, mm-hmm. which was an important part of the journey. I had to get to know that yearning because that yearning is just for all love, for God, goddess divine. It wasn't for a person, 
but it was opening my heart to the level of like oh, oneness, wanting to be one. It's that it's that yearning that you read in the mystical poetry of like mm. Rumi and Hafiz and the Radiant Sutras and this this yearning for something. So I sat in practice with my yearning for years. Like I laid on the floor and felt my yearning. And I had teachers that were like supporting me in this heart opening feminine practice. And I would lay on the floor and I would moan and I would groan and I would cry and I would pray. And I, the thing that I didn't, that I stopped doing at first, I'd be like, I just trusting, I'm trusting it's all going to come. I know he's coming. (laughs) And then eventually I was like, oh, the agony. Oh, ah." I just made a terrible face. (laughs) (laughs) But I let myself feel the depth of the yearning. Mm -hmm. I will say that comes from teachers that were and mentors that were helping me and going like, you're going to have to pull the walls down. You're going to have to let go of control, my love. You can't be like, oh, here's the timeline and oh, it's all happening perfectly, et cetera. Sure, on some level. But where is the vulnerable not not knowing? Like that, the, the like letting go of control, like falling into the sea of your yearning. Obviously not living in there every day. And then you pick yourself up, you take a shower, you send an email, you know. (laughs) But I had so much, and I will use the word healing. I had so much healing and organization of my own inner world and my own wounds, my own um, cravings and graspings and showing and that I needed to do to get clear to be landed in my heart, Mm -hmm. to pull down my walls and my defenses and my know-it-all and my I'm too cool and I'm so badass. Like I had a lot of massaging and crumbling to do. Mm. And in the years, you know, right before I met my partner, I had like a year where I was like, I'm going to go hard on the healing because I'm getting, I'm like past the point of ready. (laughs) It's like overachiever (laughs) healing year. (laughs) And I um, I studied with an amazing tantric Buddhist teacher, and then I went on this amazing retreat my friends Paul and Erica led, and then I went and I did ceremony in Costa Rica at Soltara, actually. Um, they invited me to go there, and um, it was so funny. So I, I sat in front of the healers, like, at the before the first ceremony, and they, like, set you up to sit with the healers. I think you've been there, right? Um, and they're like, okay, tell them what you're, you know, what you're here for. And I'm like, you know, um, I I'm, I can speak Spanish. So I'm like, you know, quiero abrir mi corazón. Like, I'm like, I just want to open my heart. And they're like, uh, okay. And I'm like, I just want to, you know, I want to open my heart to love. And they're like, okay. And then this woman who's working there, she said, she wants husband and children. And they go, oh. oh. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> Oh my God. Cultural communication gap. <laughs> I was like, I come from LA speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, and, um, you know, it was so funny. And I was like, I felt like all my other ceremonies, because they started kind of sitting off and on when I was 28 until, I guess, till then, that was like you know, 35 or something. Um, but all my other ceremonies felt like I was sifting through so much childhood stuff and parent stuff and this and that. And this is the first time I was like, oh, I'm literally just here for me. Mm. Like, I'm just here to be with, like, where is my heart? Like, what's between me and receiving this love? Um, and I can't explain what happened in those four ceremonies. As you know, it's like different podcasts, uh-huh. a whole other a three-part series. But, um, but... You know, that was in September, and then I sat in some more ceremonies in November, Mm -hmm. and then I met my partner in February, Mm -hmm. and I can't say, I'm not telling everyone to go do ayahuasca to open your heart, because it wasn't just that. It was like, I was really clear that I wanted to know what was in the way Mm -hmm. for me, Mm -hmm. and I had to break down a lot of like how special I thought I was, how cool I thought I was. Like there was a lot of melting of my ego and identities. Um, and that was scary, you know? It's like I had just thought that I had become so cool and so special. Another layer of, you know, I had had one career where I was really cool and special in filmmaking and then I let that go and then I built another one. And I was like, ah, like I'm fucking rocking it. But there was something in my vibration, 
and in my demeanor that like wasn't open fully like it still had a little bit of a veneer mm. of like you know like you can't fully get in here um actually our mutual friend Jessica Winterstern Atard she was an amazing example for me uh when I was doing this deep heart opening work I worked with her one-on-one -on -one and we both kind of trained in the same lineage and I was like she just helped me to see what it what it was like to be someone who lived from the heart and wasn't trying to prove herself. I still I was I, I still had a lot of that proving myself in me. And I'm not saying this to be, you know, sort of to to go too deeply into my personal experience, but because I see it in so many women around me. Um and and Jessica was just like so I'm living in her heart living like not like not trying to prove or show off or anything and that was really helpful to be around another woman and and I was around some others too who were like let me show you what it's like to to be in devotion mm -hmm. now that doesn't mean that like I still for probably the first I don't know year and a half to two like even this last year I was still having to like I the the, the badass feminist like I'm so fucking powerful would still come through in moments in my relationship when I was feeling insecure and totally shut my partner's heart. Like total, it was like, boom, like that doesn't work in this relationship. Like that tactic that had worked for me in the past of like being like, I'm strong, I'm clear, I can manage anything, I'm great, I can handle it all. Mm. Like I had to show the depth of my pain and the depth of my, you know, ugh, in the moments that I most didn't want to. So, you know, there was like the pre, the preschool, <laughs> like the, and now being in like the school school <laughs> where, I, where before it was me in my home with my a coach mentor being like, okay, like I'm going to learn how to bear my heart in this vulnerable way and da, da, da. And then, oh no, now there's like a human standing in front of me. And like, he's really like just looking at me in this way that makes me want to just be so fucking like, strong and like ah uh. and I'm like you're asking me to be even softer in this moment life god goddess divine and it's like that has taken me still like a lot of practice like my therapist is like wow like I think you I think that part of you transform like there we do a lot of parts work mm -hmm. and it's like parts are wonderful because you get to see kind of how uh different aspects of you come forward in these moments where you maybe feel a little shy or insecure or scared or upset. So yeah, the heart school, the love school has just, it just continues. Like I'm, I mean, I still feel like I'm a baby in it, but at least I'm like, I'm, I'm in the game <laughs> and I'm in the game that I want to be in. Cause I was in lots of different games before this partnership, but this is, this is the playing in the arena that is like, this is the one. This is, I don't know how long it will be. I don't know the, 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 you know, any of that. But I know that like I'm doing what I'm meant to do, which is to be in relationship connection as a spiritual transformational practice, not a casual thing. Though we do like watch TV, some, you know, and stuff like we have casual moments. But we also have this spiritual foundation. Like we're here on the planet not to just chill. Like we're here to awaken. We're here to heal. I didn't know if I'd find someone else who who was who was in that game. Mm. I thought I'd have to convince someone to get in there with me, mm. like awaken them. Mm. I tried that with several people. Let me like awaken you a little bit, and then like we'll get together. And then we'll start to <laughs> spa. <laughs> Which I mean that that can work. I have seen that with other women who meet someone, and they're like, "You've got to get on board this train if you're gonna be with me." You know. So I'm not saying that you know, my journey is not absolutely the only journey at all mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah that's kind of it in a nutshell <laughs> you mentioned something about before we went into the podcast about uh, the venus sequence and mm -hmm. going deeper into it and richard talked about that there's sort of two paths to evolution mm -hmm. one is meditation and contemplation and the other is love and so bouncing off of that statement do you believe that um, love is one of the ultimate dojos in life to meet yourself and to quantumly heal? 
And if so, what do you believe are the traits that both have to exhibit for that to be able to happen? Mm. Well, yes, I absolutely feel like love is a dojo. There are so many other amazing ones. I think that there's been a lot of talk about love and relationship within psychology and there are great books. But there's not as much in the spirituality space of love as a practice, love as your spiritual practice. Like there's less, right? Mm. David Dady's work is like the the a great person who's been doing that. And then you have kind of like the tantric work with it's not it's that has it, uh, there's so many different uh, sectors and Neo and Tibetan and this and that. So, the, but the, it's not that word, love as the practice, right? Like there, there's much more in there, m- many other energies within that space. What I like, I like how Richard Rudd just broke it down, like just really simple. And I'd never heard anyone say that, like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, like the yogis were mostly dudes sitting on meditation cushions or not cushions. That's so Western. Okay. Sitting (laughs) (laughs) cross-legged. They didn't have cushions. (laughs) I doubt. (laughs) Actually, when I first started meditating, I was meditating with a group that were very yogic and they wouldn't let us use cushions. And what I would do, because I have like hips and thighs and a booty, I would wear like four sweaters and then I would take off like three of them right before the meditation and make my own cushion. (laughs) Oh, so smart. Wow. She knows how to play the game. <laughs> anyway, because um, it wasn't that, that that position is not also like the easiest for all bodies and all body types. Um, I just I like just lost my own train of thought thinking about me with the sweaters. Um, anyway, so yeah. So I like how Richard Red breaks it down. So like, hey, this is a different path. And I'm like, yeah, thank you. Thank you for validating this thing that I know, that I know other people know. But it's not like, you know, when you go into certain traditions, there are really clear practices and rules and this and that. This is like an uncharted space in a way. Like it's not, there's not a particular mantra. There's not a particular this, that. It's very... Uh, the space of the heart, love as the practice. It's like, there's no set book for that. You know, it's something that we know and that we're knowing and maybe it will start to move into the collective in a new way. Just as like mindfulness, no one knew about mindfulness, like, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago or something, Mm -hmm. right? They'd be like, what does that mean? So the, the concept of people in relationship, using relationship as a vehicle for awakening perhaps that will move into the collective in a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, again, not necessarily approaching it from this like neo-tantric space where it's about, uh, you know, sitting with a stranger or something like that's very different than being in a committed partnership and being in that dojo that you show up to every day. Not one is better than the other, not saying that. Um, and so the rules of that game or that tradition or that lineage are unwritten, you know? There are some, there are a few great teachers who create rooms and spaces and, you know, give little whispers of how to engage in the practices. And yet there's there's a beauty in the mystery of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think, though, that women like us are going, oh, wow, I am approaching relationship in this way. I want a relationship that is a part of my awakening where I'm not just like, okay, bye, babe, I'm going to ceremony. And then I come home and then we don't have, but we're, uh, the ceremony is happening in my house. Like the ceremony is happening in my house often. (laughs) Sometimes it's ugly. Sometimes I'm like on the floor of the closet with the door closed, sobbing. My partner's on the other side, you know, the ceremony. Like I'm laying on the floor in the dark, yeah. you know, because of a rupture that happened. Um, mm-hmm. And and that that to to have the the knowledge that there's nothing wrong with that. That's the thing, right? From the psychology and the psychological perspective, we would think, oh, we want to avoid those moments, right? Those are, we don't want to have people crying in the dark on the, the floor of the closet. We got to fix that ASAP. But if you know, if you sat in other ceremonies, mm-hmm. you may be crying in the floor in the dark, mm-hmm. right? Like- and that's actually a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. So there's there's an approach where we can look at that, yeah, that love space as just another space of deep, deep ceremony. 
Mm-hmm. And that takes two people that are willing to, you know, do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it, it, the way that... It, it, the way that you're describing it is allowing me to come back to a deeper place of intention when uh, a love interest or a relationship is, is is forming and to actually almost visualize myself willingly with intention and agreeance that I am entering a dojo and to walk in and make sure that I'm dressed in the right clothing and the visual is like I walk in and I stand opposite my partner he's also agreed to walk into the dojo mm-hmm. right it's like so a, it's important. like an active conscious agreement of like okay I'm going to walk into the dojo and we both we look each other with a bow out of respect and then to recognize okay we're going to commence into a ceremony together now yeah. however in this space there is codes self-awareness and an illumination available that cannot be possible when alone. Yeah. Now, being in solitude has its own potent medicine. And then to be in um, relationship, I find that the space that I learn to grow is from the place when there is a gap between. Mm-hmm. So whether it's a gap in communication, a gap in physical connection, someone, you know, the other partner has traveled for a week and we haven't spoken now that gap is subjective Mm -hmm. to whatever is placed in the gap and usually what is placed in the gap Mm -hmm. is past wounding Mm -hmm. now the gap doesn't exist if it's just me myself and i and so so empowering just to be there everything's good yeah exactly it's easy it's like oh no i everything's good and i'm rocking this single life and you know i'm I'm doing my own thing and i'm meeting people at events and i'm going home like but to sit in the presence of somebody and to wake up in the morning go to sleep feel amazing feel super depressed feel like every single key on the keyboard in the presence of somebody else that is witnessing you in your human and learning to love yourself in the entirety while not projecting your own personal experience onto them not creating the blame anything outside of ourselves while also being willing to take ownership and break it down in the complete mush in the presence of someone you deeply care about and love now that i found is where the most of my growth has happened that and sisterhood yeah sisterhood yeah and so um Mm -hmm. if do you have like a say for example the the visual that i had of like stepping into the dojo but okay Mm -hmm. we're going into ceremony now do you open your relationship container in a ceremonial way Mm. well we live together but we do practices together we do spiritual practices together we'll meditate we'll do breath work we'll you know, we'll do all kinds of stuff, but but that's not where the crazy ceremonies happen. It's not when we're like, oh, we're going to do a polarity practice or we're going to, you know, do write some poetry together. Th- those are, you know, really sweet contained moments usually. Um, the moments where things things arise, it's like you we're working with our unconscious. Mm-hmm. We don't see it coming. You know, sometimes you can feel like just a little hair coming or maybe you're under-resourced or tired or something. A little crunch on the horizon. (laughs) (laughs) But sometimes it just comes in like a... Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh shit, we're in ceremony. Now, this this is the moment. I I really, I I bring it back to medicine because it's like you could let your mind just uh, unravel into the story and get totally hijacked and possessed by whatever. Or you can go back, oh, these aren't my thoughts. These are thoughts coming from the wound oh, this isn't truly me right now. Oh, wow, how interesting I'm having these crazy thoughts right now. <laughs> like that, because the what exists in our unconscious, which we don't have access to all the time, right? But it's, it's there. It's good that it comes up. We get to check in with it. Mm-hmm. But it's frightening. It can feel frightening. And if you don't have a practice, right, of awareness, of watching your thoughts, of regulating your nervous system, huge. Just knowing, even knowing, oh, wow, this is dysregulating me because my childhood wound of rejection or abandonment is rising. Mm -hmm. I love the gene keys for, you know, kind of uh, showing us some of our wounding, et cetera. I have the rejection wound in my heart sequence three times. Oh, you have a triple? Isn't that terrible? In your Venus sequence? You have a triple in your Venus sequence? (laughs) Yes. God bless you. I know. And And you also are packed with a superpower. 
of the heart. Too. Thank you. Thank it you. It goes both ways. Thank you. It does. It goes both ways. But so it's a strong so, curriculum. It's a strong curriculum. Yeah. So you know that if if you've done any work on yourself, you know, oh, cute. It's my abandonment wound. It's right here. Oh, this is that thing. Oh, I'm not good enough. Whatever your go to things are, I think at, at a certain point on your journey, you start to learn. Oh, these are some of my core wounds. Mm -hmm. These are some of my patterns of thought that come up. So then when you're in, you know, the ceremony space of love in the kitchen, sometimes, often, <laughs> where things go down, then you're able to just watch. It's the same as being on a cushion in a ceremony with a plant or medicine, but it's happening in real time. So you're able to watch, you're able to feel, you're, you, you're holding the part of yourself that's hurting you're trying not to project that onto your partner. You're trying to feel, you know, it's, it's a lot going on in those moments, trying to regulate your nervous system, whatever it is. And there's so much growth there, so much growth. I mean, some people have been doing that way longer than, than I have. Something that my partner said recently, he was like, people uh, uh, in relationships in these moments, they can either go numb, they can go, just go, leave, or they can grow. And so there are many people that stay in relationships, but they avoid all this potential ceremony that I'm talking about. They avoid it. Great. They're busy. They're doing other things. When the moment arises, they leave the room, and then two hours later, it's kind of done. But it's not. It's still living in the body. It's still living in the nervous system. So it's interesting because I, I do, you know, I think a lot of like modern relationship psychology and stuff is like for creating peace and creating repair, which is great. But my amazing mentor and therapist has been like the magic happens in the ruptures. And we call the ruptures, you know, ceremonies. And mm -hmm. um, Jess and I talk about this too, Jessica. Mm -hmm. And it's like, though, and they feel like you're dying because you're touching the deepest pain. Like it feels like, I don't mean physically dying, I mean existentially, like spiritually and you can you can be in that for for days sometimes depending on how long you're in this kind of relationship dojo ceremony moment mm -hmm. where you're like well how am i this is terrible and you you want to do anything possible to leave which i've also experienced in ayahuasca ceremony i'm like i never do this again this is the worst idea ever i've never felt so terrible mm -hmm. but then i've gone back again you know so it's the it's a kind of comp, like a metaphor that I use sometimes with people in the spiritual space when I'm trying to explain to them what it what it feels like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the, all the bliss. I'm not trying to just, you know, focus on like the rupture and the ceremony part. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's the piece that that we consciously or subconsciously are trying to avoid at all costs. Yeah. Uh, because um, I think that there's an association of, of when the rupture presents itself that all of a sudden this is failing. Uh, we're going, actually, this is counterproductive for the direction I want to go right. in. When actually, if we just shift the lens around it, because ultimately the most sacred thing is what is and whatever, whatever is, it's presenting itself because it's got a sacred purpose. And so actually, if we're addressing it from the perspective of, I have an opportunity to deepen my intimacy with this person. Because this rupture is showing another layer that's available in the depth in which we can go yeah. because of, of where we're willing to essentially the depth we're willing to grieve together is also the um, the heights of ecstasy that we can also accomplish together. But it's of equal measure. And so I think even just reframing, reframing is the ultimate option or ultimate way and path to inner freedom yeah. is when we reframe what is actually happening. And I think that. It's not about if it shows up, it's when. Yeah. And when it shows up, mm -hmm. what are we equipped with? Mm -hmm. And that kind of goes back on your previous point around what you had to do to even be able to be a vibrational match to your dojo mm -hmm. match in the, in the ring. Right. Like to be able to actually bow at the same, from the same perspective, takes, from the eye level. Yes. That you had to do so much work leading up yes. to that. To then be able to get into the dojo with another person that sees the rupture as a curriculum as well. Totally. Because if you're matching on that, then the intimacy is available. However, if you're not matching on that and there's a projection field, then almost I find that we become a little bit in stagnant or in checkmate. Like there's not right. really much of places we can move right. if right. it's just becoming a projection. Right, right. And if, if one partner is avoiding conflict or not speaking up or right, avoiding those moments of potential... Mm -hmm like fire and juicy mm -hmm. 
Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's the conditioning. Mm. I, I think I asked someone recently, I was like, what couples do you hear talking publicly about this level of opening, gut ripping intensity? And I, it's not a public kind of imprint that I think we've received. Like I, th- I, I, I think there are a few people like kind of, you know, touching on it, but there's still so much shame around us being people that are maybe yelling or crying on the floor or having that, but not in spiritual spaces. We're allowed to yell and cry on the floor. So why is it different in our relationship? Right. But it's, if it has that context, like you said, of two people saying, we know we're in this Mm -hmm with a certain level of awareness, Mm -hmm. mutual respect, right? Like the rules are defined in a way. Mm -hmm. I want more people to come out and talk about it. (laughs) And not just hold the veneer of like, we're a perfect spiritual couple, but like, wow, we're in the mess. We get in there. Uh And it's like opening us and healing us. And when you said like, it brings you closer together and it brings you closer to yourself so much. Mm -hmm. Because you're like, wow, I just touched a part of my childhood wounding that... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yikes and yay. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, chatting with Rachel the other day. Um, Pringle? Just uh, Rachel. Oh, this Rachel. Rachel, oh. yeah. Um, and yeah, not, but she's also dead. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, we, we've got this unspoken agreement within our friendship of uh, instead of like going to the person where the neurosis, the neurosis is like starting to show up, like, oh, this person, I'm starting to feel this. We go to each other and we're just like, these are the stories that are playing out. And then I'm like, let them air out in a place where there's no consequence or judgment. Yeah. Um, and recognizing that actually the partnership isn't just the only place right. to air out no. past trauma, wounding, and projections. No. Um, we and so to have a work. safe place of sisterhood. Yes. To That is genuinely, and you can feel it on an energetic standpoint of like, this is a place of unconditional love and unconditional judgment. And that I can be witnessed in my Kali rage. I can be witnessed in my grief. I can be witnessed in my inadequacy. I can be witnessed mm. in my unworthiness and mm. know that she's not going to withdraw her love because of some mental projection that she's placed on me that mm-hmm. I've got to be X, Y, or Z. And if I'm not, then all of a sudden the love is withdrawn. So it's a safe place mm. to actually be able to uncover the wound. It's almost like a sterile environment for a wound to be mm. like the band-aid to come mm. off and know that the air isn't going to infect it even more mm-hmm. and create an even more, a bigger wound. And so there's um, something that I just witnessed within your experience mm. of sisterhood being a huge pillar of Mm. the temple of your life Mm -hmm. and i would love for you to share a little bit more about the importance of sisterhood for you and how it has supported you to have these safe spaces to heal these deeper wounds and um why it is something that you've chosen to actually direct all of uh, a lot of your life's work in service to yeah that's such a good question I will say the like there are those pillars that we need in order to even enter that dojo. And one of them, before I get to sisterhood, is having your own practice with yourself that yeah. you that is sturdy, you know, that you have a sturdy practice, whatever it is, whether it's lighting a candle, pulling a card, whether it's a relationship to nature, but that you have enough of that within you that you're not going to sort of look for that other person to give it to you, you mm-hmm. know? And I think that's, what we talked about some of that individuation in yourself and finding that sovereignty so that then you can melt it. Right. Um, but sisterhood, I mean, it is, it's so important to me. And I, what drew me to creating spaces for women to heal together and to be expressed together is just a lot of what we've talked about, because I was like, they're, I don't see spiritual spaces where we can do the things that I yearn to do that I know that are essential for my healing. Mm -hmm. So back, I don't know, when I was like 20 or something, I was like, I'm going to make these spaces and I'm going to start doing them. It wasn't my job back then. It was just my practice. Mm -hmm. I didn't make it my actual job until like seven years ago, which was like such a funny thing to be like, wait a minute, this is just my lifestyle Mm -hmm of creating sacred spaces for women. Mm -hmm. How do I make this my job? And then I had to go through that whole kind of process. Um, But making spaces where we can come together and have the space to grieve and to, to share the depths of our hearts and to be witnessed in all of our fullness, to tell our stories, like that's just been so important to me. 
I don't want to just the only option for the connection of sisterhood be something that I saw in Sex and the City when I was 16 of coming and sitting together and having a cosmopolitan and talking about men, you know, like that's the imprint that I got growing up at my, you know, my age and in from movies. Yeah. Well. I, it's like yeah, wine so and magazine party. Sh- shopping and ma- yeah. And what I, I love shopping. I love wine sometimes. I love, you know, whatever. <laughs> but that can't be the like there, there's no realness to that. There, so it's been important for me to find those spaces for women where we could be real and then to create them. And I love it so much. I love seeing a woman just like open or melt down. Like women come into a room and everybody's kind of like, you know, holding their, their walls up. And then mm-hmm. I'm sure this happens in your spaces too. Mm-hmm. And then slowly there's just like this revelation. Watching and them give birth to themselves. Yes. It's so good. It's so good. And that level of vulnerability and trust and, and, and it's not, it's not, you can't do that everywhere. So I'm not, I, I don't advocate for women to just walk into every room and just share the depth of their soul and their heart and their grief. No, this, like safe space is very important, <laughs> you know, um, and finding the sisters that can join you. I mean, I've been holding spaces for other women partially because I'm like, you need a circle of women to hold you as you give birth to your business, your book, your whatever you're doing in the world, your, I don't know, your podcast, your your next love life, partnership, whatever. You need a circle to hold you because everything's going to come up during that time mm-hmm. as you meet something new and meet a new edge. Like, you can't just hold yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, that's part of the whole, you know, Western capitalist, like, each man on their own, da 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 No way. That's stupid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it doesn't work. Right. Like, you need people to hold you as you step. And not and not just anybody, but trusted people. So mm-hmm. I, yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of people hold me. Some of them I pay to hold me. And they're amazing <laughs> female mentors. And, and they hold me. And then women pay me to hold them. Mm-hmm. And that's just what happens. And I love it. And I'm so grateful for it. Like the mentor who, who held me all last year, I mean, she held me through some dark moments and I was just like, are we okay? She's like, yeah, I can see where we're going. Like you're pulling this thread out of a real deep place and you're okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. I needed you to say that because I inside feel like a fucking mess. (laughs) So Mm-hmm. We can't see everything. We need people who can see what we can't see because we are human. We're here working on all the stuff. We've got a unconscious, a shadow that we can't see. And we need to be honest about that. I can't see my blind spots. That's why they're blind spots. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I kind of think of it. It's like we're all walking around with toilet paper on our shoe. <laughs> And other people can see it, but we can't because there's like things that you can see about me. Oh, she, she's you know playing small there or she's so apologetic, whatever it is. There's things that you're, you can see about me and I can see about you, not just bad things or, you know, whatever, <laughs> but blind spots and, and having people we trust to go, my love, mm-hmm. I've heard you say this several times. Mm-hmm. I've heard you use this excuse mm-hmm. and I, I'm here because I want to tell you like, you don't have to use this excuse anymore or whatever, right? It's that a, was brilliant, by the way. I was convinced for a second. That you heard a previous <laughs> no, conversation I don't say anything where about I was you. using excuses. I was like, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> right there with you. <laughs> but I mean, there, there's a shadow side to that too, which is like within the spiritual community. It's like no unsolicited advice. You cannot, I do not believe that it's okay to go up to people and just be like, let me give you, let me tell you what I see about you or whatever. Um, that's <laughs> boundaries, boundaries. It's such a real thing. It's such a real thing. Consent is really important when yeah. someone is in, across the board, such like sexual yes. spaces specifically, and also just like life in general. Yes. <laughs> if people are entering into you with their opinion or whatever, I'm like, yeah. I do not, I don't want to know unless yeah. I really trust the person or I'm hiring them or they're a deep, deep soul sister. But some of my soul sisters, I wouldn't ask to reveal my blind spots mm-hmm. because they, I know their limited perspective. You know what I mean? And I know their perspective of me based off certain things. So that's why I, I really, I'm grateful for actual mentors and, mm-hmm. and, and teachers who, who can see. And then there are women who are in the practice that I am in. Very few. I trust them to see my heart. 
but I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to ask someone who speaks Chinese spirituality to, you know, interpret my Portuguese spirituality, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're walking different paths. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I have those women that I'm like, oh, you're, you're living on the path of the heart. You doing those crazy ceremonies too? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but I have some other friends that if I told them some of the crazy pain and, and things that were rising in me in ruptures, they'd be like, girl, get out of that relationship. Like you deserve better. I can, you don't, you don't need to go through this. Like this is too much pain. This is too much. Right. Mm -hmm. And again, like I would equate that to either exercise or medicine work. You know, it's mm -hmm. like sometimes in exercise, you like, you're like, ah, oh, right. you, you got to keep going. Or in sometimes in medicine work, it does feel terrible. So Yeah, it's a it's very specific who I trust to give me feedback and, mm -hmm. and to enter into that really sacred, sacred space. But regardless of that, that's kind of the more, you know, intimate level. Just being in circles with other women where we can kind of open in this way, I think is really important. Co-ed spaces are really important and beautiful too. And at the practice that I'm kind of living into the energy in them is way more complex. Mm -hmm. So I'm not necessarily like looking to do all that opening with, with that level of complex kind of energetic dynamics around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But some people are really good at that. I'm just, mm -hmm. yeah, I just, I, I, there, I love women's spaces. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I'm completely mirroring and parallel you with, with the, with the decision to accumulate many tools under one shell and then to utilize it in service predominantly to women's work um in the sense of recognizing the, the potency the power and the the opportunity to illuminate so many different um, unconscious patterns in these spaces and also the discernment around the immediate individuals who there is a deep level of respect of the way that they have chosen to weave in the world and how they respond to stimulus over a series of time that resonates and how their external reality hums at the frequency of that which you wish to create. Mm. Then the reflections when solicited are everything, like pure gold. However, the, the discernment is the gatekeeper yeah. because even just with social media, And I know that you have a social media presence. It's so easy for people. <laughs> like, and it's a realm of unsolicited <laughs> advice. Like, I mean, no matter what you oh post, like, a, depending on the size of your totally. audience, totally. are going to receive unsolicited advice and yeah. reflections and projections. And it's a minefield. Yeah. And so there's like layers to. Do you get energetic. sassy with them sometimes? Huh? Do you ever get sassy? Like, stay yeah. in your lane, honey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's i mean it it's actually kind of comical you know yeah. and we're the first generation that have had this as like the leading edge of, of our expression in the world of like oh this is how i connect with the world at large instead of having to leave my own home like yeah. this is putting me out there in in a way that i'm available to many many people and also the projections of and then there's the refinement and the discernment of going okay like a hun hun hummingbird the hummingb hummingbird knows where their places of nectar ex lie and exist yeah. and they are mapped out okay well i know that there's nectar over there i know there's nectar here and i know there's nectar there and everything else in between is wilderness mm. and there's all of the animals mm. and the creatures and the insects and the elements and everything that exists within those places of nectar however i've clocked based off of my discernment where genuine nectar lies mm. and i know to return to that whenever um i'm you know hungry for example wow. from a hummingbird perspective so <laughs> It's like the discernment of the, the the path of sisterhood of like what we see in the movies, mm -hmm. which um, is, girl, you better dump him. Like, he's not good for you. Like, right. that kind yes. of blanket expression. And then there's like deeper levels of, I see you. I walk a very similar path. I respect you and your decisions. I respect you over a prolonged period of time and how you've responded to life. Mm. And right now I can't see myself mm. because I'm in the middle of my sacred shit. Yes. And so I'm calling in a trusted reflection that can bring me home. Yeah. Just like Ram Das would say, you know, we're all walking each other home is that I don't like to use the word need often. However, there are 
moments of mm-hmm. like it's actually really important to be mm-hmm. able to lean into each other and recognize like we need connections yeah. where yeah. we can be safe to be with whatever is alive mm-hmm. without there being the fragmented judgment placed in the field totally. because that's the only place that we can truly heal and also oftentimes relationships are not that safe place in the sense that because there's an identification of you're my partner you're supposed to be a certain way and when you are sad for three months on end all of a sudden now this right. is affecting how i show up in the world and so there can be subtle pieces of judgment that are, that are infiltrated yeah. into the space. Obviously, it's depending mm-hmm. per yeah. relationship. Yeah. However, within the sisterhood, I found it's much, um, once the discernment is put in place based off of the person, how they weave in the respect, once that alliance has been cultivated, it only gets better mm. because both people are willing to stand in the crunchy mm-hmm. and to find the next level of intimacy mm. in a place of unconditional love and unconditional mm-hmm. love judgment. Yes, yes. Yes. So sisterhood is like um, it is. I just it's like, a plant medicine ceremony. It's a relationship. It is. It's a um deeply humbling, vulnerable, transparent process. Mm-hmm. And I love that you have received so much value to the point that you've now made it your work in the world. I know, it's so funny. You can hire me to be your dear sister. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but that that's also when you know that your passion is behind it because you do it for free. You yeah. did it for free. It oh, wasn't yeah. even a thought. No, I that did this it for free for years. Yes. And, you know, exactly. I would have rituals at my house uh-huh. and poetry readings and moon circles and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So what does your um, offering regarding sisterhood look like today? Mm. So I work with women one-on-one, a mm. few women. It's something I can't do with that many women, but I love intimacy. So, you know, anytime I do two, like I'm, thought about doing the big things or things where I don't have the contact. It's just less my desire and my personality. Like Mm -hmm. I like to feel people Mm -hmm. and I like to get in there with them. Mm -hmm. So I have a handful of women I work with one-on-one and then I have an online uh, circle of women and community that we meet twice a month. And I've been doing that for like seven years. First it was called moon club and that was really sweet. And it was with my friend Ruby Warrington and, um, and this was like, I don't know, yeah, six years ago, seven years ago. And I would lead like shamanic heart journeys on the full moon. Um, someone messaged me the other day and said they they had a recording of one. They were like, oh, I did this journey from back 2016. I'm like, great, girl. <laughs> um, and now I've brought in where there was like lunar ritual and, and, and journeying. Now I've brought in more embodied practice. Mm-hmm. So embodying different archetypes, a lot of partner work, even on Zoom, which is really cool because that's virtual. Um, and uh, yeah, I, it's really fun. So there's a lot of connection, a lot of people up on their feet. Also prayer, ritual, uh, breath, sensual movement, writing, just like a beautiful spiritual space for women to gather and just to tend to the self. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I lead retreats. Mm-hmm. So, you know, now and then and, and writing, I've got my next book coming out with Sounds True next year called Dare to Feel the Transformational Path of the Heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So the next iteration. Uh, when's the, wh- wh- where is the, um, where are the retreats usually held? The retreat, you know, this last year I did one um, at Kripalu Center in Massachusetts with my dear friend. I'm not doing that there this year, but I did the last two years at a beautiful place in Zion, Utah. Where, and that's mm-hmm. literally because my partner has been going there for 15 years. Mm-hmm. And he was like, well, I lead a men's retreat every year. Like, why don't you lead a women's one at the same time, but just like in a different kind of area on the property? So I did that the last two years. and It was awesome. I can imagine the polarities that are being charged. I know, but we can't see them. Like a few times you'll but hear you them screaming. Them. <laughs> what? You can feel them. You can feel them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's been really fun to do the last two years. And there's like a beautiful cave that we go dance in and stuff. So, yeah, I've and been you're... simplifying my work since I've been in this dojo of, you know, mm-hmm. all the mm-hmm. kitchen ceremonies. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> Your work is making ripples out into the world that um, I know that you you know nothing about. And yet is, you know, trickling into the in-between moments, whether it's like going on to the elliptical in the morning and hearing your book or mm. being able to be a part of what it is you share through social media or in your retreats. Um, and ultimately, I feel like you are um, a deep sea diver that has the ability to extract gold from the bottom of the ocean and then mm. to bring it up to the surface and share it with other people. And mm. um, it's such a blessing to be able to be in the presence of 
of of a being with um, such an existential kink for the burn. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, I let you go. But we're doing it more softly at this phase <laughs> of life, okay? More rooted. More yeah. So- but yeah, it still burns. <laughs> we're, we're in the we're in the mother archetype right now. Actually, um, so we are nourishing uh, the soil beneath our feet in a soft and yet juicy manner. <laughs> um, I like to ask my guests this, and it may put you on the spot for a hot minute. Um, okay. If this is like totally off on a tangent, if your microphone, let's oh, say no. your microphone, is oh, no, I was in. Yeah, 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 gonna yeah, yeah. we're gonna go, <laughs> we're gonna go, like, we're gonna go into the pie. Your microphone is plugged into mm. all media outlets around the whole planet, mm. almost like the president. You know, like the president is giving a big news flash, and you have thirty seconds to deliver a message to all of humanity. Mm. What would be the message that you would deliver? I mean, I'd want it to be a feeling, but I would want my words to be like packed full of the feeling. So, okay, let's imagine that I have so much deep practice that my words are so packed with the feeling. I would just want to say you are so loved. Yeah. And that my voice was like a blanket that wrapped around every lonely heart, every sad person, every, you know, person contemplating their death or... Yeah, just like you're loved, you're so loved. Just a reminder. It's almost like a, a magical spell that comes out through the vibration of your voice and it goes out through the TV screen and then they're like, oh. yeah. and even the most lonely of hearts receive your message and your words. And so. It is true. I was thinking when, when I heard you ask this question on your podcast, I was thinking, I wonder if we all answer from our own sacred wound. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you can do a little, you know, research mm-hmm. later. Because I think my... So much of my healing has been around my heart. Mm. And so that's why I'm drawn to to, to reveal that to others. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ultimately, that's really the answer to all of it, even though, you know, it seems so obvious. And, and also it's extremely potent. And mm. every single thing that we experience in our life is founded from a deep sense of self-love. Mm. And that self-love is believing that we're lovable and that we can actually love ourselves. And then everything starts to fractal out from that disposition. Mm. And whether you're talking you know, about sisterhood or the journey that you've been through up until this point to claim your power and your voice um, and also showing up and being able to be matched in partnership with somebody that met, meets you in the de- depth and also simultaneously the heights. This is all founded on you transmuting all the areas that have not been rooted in self-love back into self-love so that you can actually start to be able to be of service in this way. Yes. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today and for sharing your wisdom and your grace and your magic and to be able to actually sit with you in person and to look into your eyes and receive your codes and your wisdom has been such a gift for me Mm. uh, outside of just hearing your voice through the through the audible book Mm. Um, and I'm so so grateful for your presence. Mm. So for all of those that are listening um, or watching how can they find you and continue you on the journey of, of where you choose to go next mm. well if you haven't read my first book fuck like a goddess heal yourself reclaim your voice stand in your power is the full title so it's like it's not just fuck like a goddess there's more to do um yeah. <laughs> you can get that book um i also i am fairly active on social media and it's just my name on instagram at alexandra roxo mm-hmm. i have a small baby podcast it's you know in its first year ish and it's called holy fuck mm-hmm. and i really go into what is sacred what is profane um what does that mean to us um and yeah my website's alexandra roxo so mm-hmm. you know Perfect. you can find me there incredible Thank you so much. Oh, oh, thank I'm so you. excited for anybody that has not come across you yet or has not come oh. across a book or has not come across your weavings, your spaces, um, the excitement of, of those that are going to continue to funnel into what you are creating and how it's going to illuminate their lives because I can personally say that it's illuminated mine and I'm really grateful for that. It's truly mm. a gift. Thank, thank you me. so much for having me and asking such great questions. Oh, thank you. Yeah. All of you beautiful humans, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Deja Blue podcast. If you resonate with this episode today, then please go ahead and share it on your Instagram story. Tag myself and Alexandra and um, we can be able to then reach many more people that we would not be able to reach alone. And so we have a beautiful sacred responsibility to share the resonance if it resonates. (laughs) And may this podcast illuminate you in areas where you may still not be free, but that you crave that depth to truly allow yourself to be liberated through a deeper level of self-love. And really allowing yourself to embrace all aspects of your own experience from the dark side of the moon to the light side of the moon recognizing all of it is sacred and all of it is welcome here so we're sending you so much love and until next week blessings 
Today's sponsor of this podcast is Becoming Prosperous, which is a four-week online self-guided course aligning you with what it truly means to live a prosperous life. So if you want to check out the link in the show notes here on YouTube and also on all podcasting audible platforms.